me introduce myself. My name is Randy Haddock. I'm on staff with the Cahaba River Society. The Cahaba River Society is a nonprofit citizen advocacy group whose mission is to restore and protect the Cahaba River and the rich diversity of life that relies on it. Now, that diversity includes the people who drink water from the Cahaba through the Birmingham Waterworks Board system, as well as the well known rich diversity of aquatic life that uh, lives there. Now, uh, the Cahaba River is located in central Alabama, a state that's already noted itself for its remarkable aquatic biodiversity. We have one of the greatest uh, numbers of native fishes, mussels, reptiles, crayfish, and snails of any state in the U.S. Now, if you'd like to gain a deeper understanding of exactly why Alabama supports such an outstanding diversity of life, I'd urge you to find a copy of Dr. Scott Duncan's excellent book called Southern Wonder and Alabama's Surprising Biodiversity. So, the, but even among uh, rivers in Alabama, the Cahaba stands out as an ex outstanding example of uh, its uh, rich aquatic wildlife. It probably retains a greater proportion of its original complement of aquatic wildlife of uh, any uh, Alabama river. We have 128 different native fishes, 36 mussels, 17 crayfish, and over 30 snails, and uh, quite a number of uh, reptiles. This uh, gives you a good idea of the relative species richness of the Cahaba River compared to a couple of other much, much larger river basins out west. The uh, Colorado River watershed, and the Columbia River watershed are both about a quarter of a million square miles, which is, of course, far more than the 22,000 square miles of uh, the Cahaba River watershed. Now, uh, the Cahaba, as I mentioned before, has 120 fish species, including a lot of colorful darters and shiners, and uh, of course, the <laughs> odd little paddlefish that we see here, uh, the blue sucker, uh, the blue nose shiner, that we'll, we'll, we'll go over these next, some of the fishes of the Cahaba. Uh, Dr. Rick Maiden and Dr. Bernie Cajeda assert that the Cahaba probably has more fish species per mile than any other North American stream of its size or crater. So here are some examples. This is the long ear sunfish. It's quite a, a showy guy. This is the, the iridescent blue that shows up in uh, this fish is uh, pretty striking in that deep orange background. This uh, fish that's in the Cahaba, but it's in a lot of other streams in Alabama as well. Uh, this I'd have to say is an inadequate photo of the rainbow shiner from the Cahaba in Trussville. Uh, in the sunlight, and especially during breeding season, these fish are simply brilliantly iridescent. In fact, here's another photo of somebody who managed to capture that iridescence uh, of, the, of the rainbow shiner. Now, most of the ones I've, most of the fish that I've described so far have been small darters and shiners and things like that, and they are especially colorful in the late winter and early spring months, like right about now. Uh, as we do this in early April. But this larger fish is a, a river red horse, and it has a pretty brightly colored red tail, and a tail fin, dorsal fin, and anal fin. So it's a, a pretty showy fish as well. Here uh, we have uh, Jim Brown and Dick Mills. Uh, Jim Brown is a retired history professor from Sanford, and Dick Mills is a international ecotourism guide. They're on the little Cahab here and they're using these long poles and from the end of that pole is a, a noose or a lasso and what they're trying to do is uh, as the river red horse are on these gravelly shoals trying to spawn they're trying to guide this noose down and slip it over the head of the noose and, and, and capture it that way. This is a Native American uh, technique that's been used for many generations. And there are a couple of families in Big County that keep this tradition alive. So if you are successful, it's not an easy thing to do. I've tried it and I've done it. This is, this is my success in, in capturing a red horse using the noosing method. 
uh, it, as you can see, the, the wire tightens behind the gills and in front of the pectoral fins, and it doesn't hurt the fish. So uh, it doesn't really hurt the fish, and you can release them unharmed altogether. Now, here we have uh, a photo of the record holder for a fish caught in fresh water. Now, this is not strictly a freshwater fish. This is a gulf sturgeon, a 360 pound sturgeon that was caught in uh, Centerville in the Cahaba River at about 1941. Now, this is a fish that generally lives in the Gulf of Mexico, but there are a number of uh, marine fishes uh, called anadromous fishes that like to run upstream into fresh water to lay eggs. And the Gulf sturgeon is one of those that uh, prefers uh, laying its eggs, has to lay its eggs in, in fresh water systems. So those most of the anadromous fish runs that we have have been lost because of impoundments on the uh, rivers, uh, was particularly the bigger rivers. Those impoundments don't let the uh, fish run far enough upstream so that they have a limited the spawning habitats available to them. And I want to mention here another biological phenomena that has been lost due to impoundments of the bigger Alabama rivers, and that's the mullet runs that historically occurred as far upstream as Centerville on the Cahaba River. These runs were probably feeding runs, not, not spawning runs, but the town of Centerville has uh, used to have a big celebration where everyone in town got to go down and, and chow down on the uh, fresh supply of mullet. Another of Alabama's and the Cahaba's remarkably rich group of critters are the freshwater mussels. We have 182 different species of mussels in Alabama, and uh, they are, are a pretty interesting group. This is the map which shows the number of freshwater mussel species by state, and you see Alabama there is a, a, a clear leader <laughs> in having 182 freshwater mussel species. Now, freshwater mussels are related to the marine clams, and uh, like their marine cousins, freshwater mussels survive by drawing water in through a couple of, uh, through a, a siphon. They draw that water in, it flows over their gills, and then the food particles are captured on that gill surface, and then the water is expelled through an excurrent siphon. So they have an in-current siphon where water goes in and an ex-current siphon where the water goes out. And um, so they spend their, they, you know, you, you, you find a mussel on the riverbed and he's just kind of laying there and drawing in water and expelling that water. It's not very exciting, but it turns out that these guys have a really interesting life cycle. And that's what we'd like to describe here. Now, living in rivers presents a kind of a special problem. Rivers have this sort of habit, if you will, of always flowing downstream in one direction. And this is a real problem if you're going to expel your larvae out into the, into the water column. Uh, these would wash downstream, and if they were to survive, then the next generation would wash further downstream, and so on and so forth, until the whole population of mussels had been simply uh, washed away downstream out of the system. So mussels, just like every other river species, need a mechanism to colonize upstream habitats. Now that this process is an easy thing for fish to do. They simply swim upstream and um, repopulate uh, those upstream habitats. It's an easy thing for aquatic insects to do because uh, the vast majority of uh, aquatic larvae have adults that can fly and they disproportionately fly upstream before they lay eggs, so they repopulate the upstream parts of the stream. But mussels are not very adept, uh, an adult mussel are not very adept at traveling upstream. They, they have a foot and they can move, but they really can't cross habitat that they're not adapted to. So they have to find some other way to do that. And the general solution for how they do this is to parasitize a fish and get that fish to carry their babies upstream for them. So in this diagram, we see how male mussels, here at uh, D, this is a male mussel, he's expelled sperm into the water column, and if a female mussel draws up that sperm through the incurrent siphon, she can use that to fertilize her eggs, 
and grow and uh, nurture uh, her larvae in a marsupium and then release those larvae called glochidia into the water column. And uh, you gotta release quite a large number for this to work because these must simply randomly bump into a fish and quickly latch onto the fish where the uh, glochidia then transforms into a juvenile mussel. And after three or four weeks or so, once the juvenile is fully formed, it uh, breaks loose and falls down and falls back on the uh, riverbed. And hopefully by this time, the fish has moved around enough or has moved uh, upstream enough to keep the population of the mussel uh, engaged in, in or still existing in this river. So that's a pretty clever thing to do. And this is the fellow who first uh, recognized this life history phenomena of the freshwater mussels. This, you might, might have recognized this guy. This is Anton von Leeuwenhoek. He's the dude that uh, made the first successful microscope that you see here on the right. Um, he actually, he made drapes, but he needed a way to uh, examine the threads of the draperies more carefully. And so he invented this microscope and then turned his attention to all the <laughs> wonderful things that he was finding uh, in water and in other places that uh, uh, lent themselves to investigation for the very first time under a microscope. Now, it, he, he, he made this connection between glochidia and parasites of the fish and, and freshwater mussels. But unfortunately, uh, biologists, about 100 years later, this, this, he did this in 1860, uh, 18, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. He made this discovery in, in the 1680s, like 300, over 300 years ago. And a, a hundred years later, biologists thought he was wrong. He wasn't wrong, but they thought he was wrong. And they thought that these glochidia were free living parasites all on their own. They had nothing to do with mussels. Uh, they got that wrong, but they named those parasites glochidia parasiticum. And that name glochidia has since stuck with the larvae of the freshwater mussels. So these little glochidia look very much like a Pac-Man. If you look uh, up here in the upper left, you'll see uh, an individual glochidia. And uh, you can see how it's got a little muscle that articulates the two halves. And uh, these are electron micrographs, so you don't see the, the thin thread of a sensory hair that comes out of these, that when it touches a fish, this little Pac-Man snaps shut, either on the fins or maybe on the gills of a fish. And as it does, you see here, it, they've attached to this fin or onto the gill surface uh, of the muscle. Now, once the glochidia is uh, attached, it, uh, the gill tissue forms a cyst around the glochidia and sort of tries to wall it off. But that's not enough to keep the glochidia from getting nutrition from the gills. And, it doesn't grow physically in size very much. What it really does is it uh, grows all the body parts and transforms from this larval stage into a juvenile, which has all the body parts that uh, an adult uh, animal has. Now, on this bottom row, we see a uh, little fawn's foot. This is as large as the adult fawn's foot muscle from the Cahaba or anywhere else get. And, uh, this is a fragile paper shell. You can say <laughs> this one is so fragile that I broke off a part of it there, unfortunately. And here is a blue fur, another uh, freshwater mussel from the Cahaba that uses this approach of just creating enormous number of glochidia, which sort of randomly and accidentally bump into a fish and attach to that fish and parasitize it. However, this large mussel up in the corner is called a washboard. And the washboard has a little modification of that strategy, which helps it uh, find fish hosts. And that is that the individual glochidia are kind of strung together on an adhesive strand or a, a, a sticky uh, hair of material that they then release into the water column. And these sticky strands then are out floating through the water column. And it's a lot more likely that a fish might run through that mesh of uh, sticky strands. And when it does, this whole thing wraps around the fish and allows the glochidia that are attached to those strands to then uh, snap onto and, 
attached to the fish. So that's a little modification that helped uh, increase the odds of um, a glochidia actually finding a fish to parasitize. That way it doesn't have to create quite a huge number of glochidia that those other species have to create. And here we have another variation on the theme of uh, creating glochidia that attach to a fish. And that is, uh, this is a southern pig toe and this is a southern club shell. This one is still found in the Cahaba. This one is no longer found in the Cahaba, but it is in a few other places around Alabama. What these animals do is take their glochidia and make a, a, what they call a conglutinate, which is uh, another word for it is an ovi sac. So it's made in the gills and it is full of uh, glochidia, most of which are fertile. There are a bunch of sterile glochidia in here too that help make up the body that shapes like this. And this is pretty much worm shaped thing that the mother expels into the water column and that uh, little conglutinate or ovisac uh, floats away and it's something that a fish might see and say, oh, that's something to eat. He goes chopping on it and then gets a mouthful of parasitic glochidia. And these are these are little different, slightly different colored for the Florvima decisum, the, the southern club shell. So here you see a close up of um, one of those conglutinants, and you see there's a mature fertile glochidia, but these other, the uh, great majority of these, are only uh, glochidia that help form the body, but it helps uh, provide an opportunity for the fertile ones to attach. Okay, so here that's a little modification, a little trick, a little change of the different muscles used to uh, try to get these floating uh, conglutinants uh, out there as a lure. Now, uh, here's a, a fine line pocketbook, and it also makes a conglutinant, but instead of floating, this conglutinant, which looks very much like a, a new fish egg, I don't know if you've ever seen a fish egg, but those two dark little eye spots in, in this uh, spherical shape make it look very much like a fish egg. And well, uh, predatory fish like darters and sculpins, that they find nothing better than to find a fish egg to eat. And so these sink to the bottom where the darters and the sculpins are, rather than floating away, they sink to the bottom. And when a darter bites it, it breaks open and you see thousands of uh, the glochidia that can then get um, trapped on the and parasitize the gills of the darters and the sculpins. And on the right, we have an odd little muscle called the three horned warty back. And they call it a warty back because the shell, it's hard to see in this uh, profile, but if you look edge on, you see kind of a knob there and a knob there. And the, there are three very big prominent knobs or, or warts. So that give it uh, this muscle its name, the three horned warty back. And rather than making a conglutinate that uh, either floats or sinks, the three horned warty back makes this little white, stubby, odd looking thing that uh, it, it hangs onto it basically. But this for some reason is very attractive to freshwater drum. And I don't know why they like this so much, but clearly what happens is that uh, the three horned warty back makes this little white knobby stubby thing and the drums come along and find it and eat it. It must be very efficient because they, the warty backs spend far less energy and material making these than the other muscles we've been talking about. They make far fewer of these. So it's energetically less expensive to make this. And uh, it apparently is very effective because almost all the freshwater drum you can find are parasitized by warty back glochidia. Here we have a, a different uh, conglutinate made by a different uh, kidney shell species. And again, uh, the, the term ovisac is uh, instructive because you see this ovisac looks like a, maybe a larval fish or maybe a chironomid uh, midge larvae. But an odd thing about this one is that the tail end here you see is sticky underwater and that tail end will stick to a rock so it didn't just wash away, it, it finds the surface of a rock and is stuck there and it's very likely that a, a darter will come along and find that and, and grab it and eat it. 
okay, here's uh, here's that ovi sac that's uh, been ruptured, and you see all the conglutinates that are coming out, and you see the little Pac-Man form. They're just ready to try to clamp down on the gills or maybe the fins of the, of the, the freshwater mussel. Now, so that's uh, some different ways that a mussel uses to trick a fish into transporting its babies around. So, so far we've seen that some mussels release enormous numbers of free-floating larvae, or glochidia, that sort of randomly bump into a fish host. And then we've seen glochidia that are attached to long sticky threads that will entangle and ensnare a potential fish host. Or we've seen mussels that release a floating bundle of glochidia or, or a conglutinate that mimics a worm. Um, and then we've seen uh, conglutinates that mimic, mimic fish eggs or, or other odd little things that might be on the bottom of the stream that darters and sculpins might grab. And then that third, the, the, four, the fifth one actually <laughs> that we've seen are the three horned warty backs taking advantage of uh, a freshwater drum's odd proclivity, the funny little white stubby things. Now we've got, uh, I want to talk about a, a completely different approach that mussels have, uh, ad different mussels have adopted, and that is the use of a mantle flap lure. So here we see the shell of a freshwater mussel, and here's that in-current siphon that I mentioned before where the gills create a little current that draw water in the in-current over the gills, it filters out the food particles, and then is expelled to the ex-current siphon. Uh, and that's the actual mantle itself. It, it helps build the layers and layers of a shell, uh, for one thing, it, it functions in. But you see this right here, and you see something that looks very much like a minnow. It's got a, it almost looks like it has a mouth. It's got an eye spot, dorsal fin, a tail fin. There's even sort of a dark little lateral line that, uh, that, that mimics the lateral line of the of minnow. It, besides just sort of looking like this, the uh, the muscle the female will take this and wiggle it so that it acts like a muscle uh, acts like a, a minnow and uh, is even more appealing to a, a predator. So when um, a fish like a bass that might uh, take a little minnow like that sees it, it runs down there and grabs a hold of it. Or when it does, it often ruptures the uh, oh, marsupium where the female is uh, raising up the, the glochidia. So here you see a lure or a lampsless, and in the center there, you see the a marsupium, a specialized part of the gill that's a, been a, kind of turned over to growing up the glochidia. So when a bass reaches down there and bites into this, it ruptures the marsupium and lots of the mar uh, glochidia are released and the fish gets a mouthful of that. So here's a different, mantle flap lure that quite obviously I'd say mimics a crayfish and the cray you see the eyes you see the legs you see the tail flipping like a like a crayfish does and beyond simply looking like a crayfish the female has her foot planted in the stream bed and she swings her whole shell so that the crayfish looks like he's swimming backwards like crayfish do. Now, here on the left, we have a mantle flap lure of a fine line pocket puck. And this, I would argue, is a pretty good mimic of this little guy. Well, not little, this is probably three, at least three inches or more. This is called a helgramite or a Dobson fly larva. And it, it's a, obviously a predatory um, insect larvae that feeds on other insects. Uh, and uh, it's uh, about the best fish bait you can find. If you can get a help a fisherman often get a window screen and a couple of poles and go kick over rocks so they can collect a few Helgramite larvae to bait with because it's almost certainly going to get you uh, 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 a bite from a bass or something like that. Now, in addition to this mantle flap lure, the fine line has an additional strategy. And that is that it can also make a, a super conglutinate. So we talked about conglutinates before when it, a, a mother can create, oh, you know, uh, 50 to 100 little bundles of her uh, glochidia in little bundles and little packages and release. In a super conglutinate, all of the 
uh, glycidia are, are bundled into a structure that looks like a, a minnow. And then here we have uh, an example of that. So here's the muscle. You, you can't see the clear tube, but that is the super conglutinate of the, of the muscle. There you can see the tube, and it uh, looks pretty much like a, a, a minnow swimming around in the water. It, it's really a pretty effective lure, and it's something that uh, if you look on the web, you can find videos of uh, bass uh, grabbing hold of one of these. Now, so far, what we've described are, uh, I guess you'd say, passive lures. They attract the fish. And if the fish is sufficiently uh, deceived, uh, it might take a bite out of uh, uh, a conglutinate or a super conglutinate or a, or a mantle flap lure. But here we have something different going on. This fish is called the mobile log perch. And it has kind of a long snout. And it's kind of, a, as, as fish snouts go, it's kind of a hard and tough. And the reason is, is that they, a log perch uh, has this uh, habit of nudging rocks and flipping over rocks because insect larvae, they don't hang out on the top of rocks. They'd just be fish bait as they were. They hide underneath the rocks and down in the crevices and gaps and spaces between the rocks. So the mobile log perch is successful because he, he, he'll nudge the rock and maybe turn it over and the fish larvae will float away and then they, they grab it. However, we also have the uh, comb shell species of mussels that take advantage of that fact. And what they do is if a log perch comes along and tries to turn over a comb shell, the comb shell will grab him by the nose and then he has a little a set of teeth along the outside edge of the shell that can help hold it. And then the mussel starts pumping uh, larvae into the uh, mouth of the of the of the mobile log perch, and it gets a pretty heavy infestation on the gills. So here we have a comb shell, and you kind of see some teeth right along there that uh, are going to be useful here in a second. So a log perch, he sees something interesting, he starts to turn it over and snap. So the comb shells grab the hole, and this poor log perch doesn't know what to do. He's he's <laughs> He's flailing around at this point and uh, he's trapped. So uh, what's happening now is that the, the, uh, comb, the, the comb shell is starting to pump larvae into the mouth of the fish and out the gills and gets a pretty heavy infestation of, uh, uh, whoops, let me back up, sorry, of uh, the, the poor little fish. Here's a, a, a different, uh, kind of muscle in that same group. This is called a riffle shell. And I'm not sure what it is that's appealing about this little white uh, feathery thing, but apparently it's something that uh, is attractive to fish and maybe at least they'll come and investigate. Here comes a little darter. He's looking around and oops, there's the riffle shell grabbing a hold. And not only does this shell and this shell clamp down, you also see this sympallium membrane that also helps form the seal around the poor little darter there. And uh, at this point, the, the, the poor little darter is struggling. It, it really it can't even breathe very well. Uh, but it would be a really bad idea for the muscle to kill the darter, because then it wouldn't move its little babies around. So it begins to relax its hold. And then you see here the glycidia, uh, little bits of glycidia that the Darter is beginning to suck in or in, over its gills and getting a, an infestation of these uh, little parasites on its gills. So uh, now the fish is beginning to percolate well and it's starting to recover. And actually, the, the muscle is going to try to kind of push him out and blow him out. So now the fish, with its new supply of parasites on its gills, is uh, ready to swim away. And after three or four weeks, the little glycidia will rupture the gill and fall out and hopefully it falls into the right kind of habitat. Now, in order to enhance the chances that this will work out, the, the muscle is uh, trying to attract a kind of fish 
that hangs out in the right kind of habitat. All these mussels have their own unique habitat and uh, they want to enhance the chances that a larvae will fall, that, that the, I'm sorry, the juvenile, transformed juvenile will fall out in the right habitat by attracting a fish that hangs out in that habitat. So um, that's part of the strategy of why they make the particular lure that they do. Now, finding a fish host is not the only problem that freshwater mussels have to face. Um, sometimes uh, we've seen in our streams with heavy uh, sediment loads that uh, deposition of sediment can smother habitat. And maybe even more importantly, uh, since these animals are filter feeders, um, they can't just jump up and run away when a water quality uh, problem comes along. They've got to somehow endure that. So anytime there's a water quality issue, they can only just breathe minimally and, and not feed. And uh, they're just very sensitive to um, water quality conditions. And that's why we've seen uh, such a high proportion of these uh, freshwater mussel species that uh, have not survived uh, the water quality that we're creating these days. And the last uh, problem that I'll mention is uh, a drought. Uh, you see here a southern pocketbook that uh, is experiencing a sort of a low water problem. Here's the in-current siphon and the ex-current siphon. This poor little guy can't even breathe at this point. It, the water level's gotten so low. And it's not just that they can't breathe, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But So some mussels have adapted to the fact that water levels in rivers change. And here you see a groove where a mussel has managed to crawl down slope uh, and made it back to water. So he's, he's back in this uh, shallow water here, but at least he's not up here on the bank anymore. But sometimes the, the slope down to deeper water is not very obvious and they just kind of wander around not knowing where exactly to go and if they're lucky they make it to deeper water and if they're not lucky they don't. So here's, here's one that started up here on the bank and he's kind of meandered around. <laughs> I thought that one was kind of interesting. Now it's not just that they uh, have to stay in the water but they have to get in deeper water because any mussel that makes it out here is still in shallow water and uh, raccoons and uh, muskrats and other things that can find them. So if they don't make it to deep water, they become uh, prey to uh, a lot of different uh, animals that can eat them. Well, mussels aren't the only interesting mollusks that we have in our river. Snails are another group of uh, critters. And here again is a map of the number of freshwater snails by state. And you see that uh, Alabama has far more snails and I, I, this may be 300 rather than this, when this map was made, uh, uh, species of snails in Alabama. Uh, in the Cahaba, we have 31 different kinds of snails. Here's a federally endangered snail called a cylindrical lyoplax. Here's a, an endangered species called a flat pebble snail. And this one in the lower right is called the Cahaba pebble snail. And it's interesting because um, it was described in the 60s and by the 70s they couldn't find it again and they declared it extinct and about 2005 uh, Dr. Stephanie Clark uh, rediscovered this uh, Cahaba pebble snail in the Cahaba River National Wildlife Refuge and uh, so it wasn't as extinct as we thought it was which is nice. Now this thing is really quite maybe the reason that it wasn't found it's quite small it's <laughs> Hard to, hard to recognize, hard to find, and, and she was able to find it and describe the, where it was hanging out and now other people are able to find it. So the Cahaba pebble snail has uh, actually recovered from extinction, if you will. Another uh, snail species that we thought was extinct is the uh, oblong rock snail. And uh, this is a snail that had not been seen for 70 years when uh, graduate student Nathan Whalen and Dr. Johnson at the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center decided they'd go look back again at the locations where it had been found in the past and these little squares mark those locations. And sure enough, they, they, they were able to relocate this uh, oblong rock snail again. So it's the second snail species that's been uh, found to not be extinct in the Cahaba. 
Um, this is a summary of uh, reintroductions of mollusks that were done by the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center. This is part of the Alabama Department of Natural Resources and the Fisheries uh, Division. And what they do is uh, go find the very last living uh, examples of a number of uh, mussels and snails, and they're able to rear them through their life cycle and get them to parasitize a fish, uh, get the transformed larvae off the fish, and then keep them alive and growing until they're big enough to be carried out and reintroduced in places around the, the state. So these are all the relocation uh, sites that they were used in 2012. The Cahaba is one of the favorite places to reintroduce things because the water quality is, is good enough, particularly in the south half of the river, to allow uh, all the work that goes into uh, rearing these things out. You don't want to put it into a dirty river. Uh, crayfish are another example of an aquatic group that is just, just cr crazy species rich in Alabama. We have something like 98 different crayfishes uh, species in the in the Cahaba. This has 19. I think the actual number is uh, 17 crayfish species. Uh, uh, well, native crayfish species. What we're not including in that number 17 is this is called the devil crayfish. It's an invasive species, and it actually will displace the the other native species. So it's not uh, uh, necessarily a good thing to find one of those guys. Uh, 17 turtle species? No, it's more than that. It's uh, there's about 20 some turtle species in Alabama. This is a map turtle, and a snapping turtle, and a stink pot or a musk turtle, and of course we have the good old box turtles. So Alabama is uh, really rich in uh, turtle species. And for the other aquatic groups, uh, in the insects, uh, the dragonflies and mayflies and damselflies. Uh, this thing in the lower left is actually a freshwater bryozoan. And they're microscopic, but they form this gelatinous matrix that they live in. So this is populated by thousands of uh, microscopic uh, filter feeding animals. And they uh, exude this almost like a tough jello uh, layer that they live in. And that's usually wrapped around some twigs and sticks and so forth. Those, so they stay, foot, stay put. You'll find these in, uh, slower moving water situations. And uh, that's an odd thing to find. They're, they're, some of them are the size of a basketball or so. And of course, we've got river otters and muskrats and other kinds of uh, aquatic things. Well, that's our little tour of um, aquatic biodiversity. We didn't say anything yet about the weird, wonderful uh, uh, newly discovered plants on the Big County Glades or about the Cahaba lilies, and perhaps in a, a future episode we will uh, cover that topic. But I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about the weird and wonderful things, the beautiful things that live in the Cahaba River, and we uh, hope we'll see you again next time. Thanks.